This program is made possible by the John Templeton Foundation and is a co-production of COSI, The Ohio State University, and WOSU Public Media. Where do our religious beliefs come from? Tonight, we'll talk with two men who have fundamental differences on how they'd answer that question. I'm Neil Conan, host of NPR's Talk of the Nation. Welcome to the Battelle Studio at WOSU at COSI. Our topic, why we believe what we believe. In his latest book, The Language of Science and Faith, written with Francis Collins, Carl Guyberson says that science does not overthrow the Bible and that faith does not require rejecting science. Dr. Guyberson teaches writing and science and religion at Stonehill College. Michael Shermer is interested in belief as well. The founding publisher of Skeptic magazine, he investigates why people believe in God, don't believe in the Holocaust, see human faces on the surface of Mars, think ghosts are real, and favor one political party over another. He says he's a skeptic, not because he doesn't want to believe, but because he wants to know. Well, let's start there. Michael Shermer, you were a person of faith. Now you're an agnostic. I want to hear a little bit about that journey of belief and how you changed yours. Uh, I'm an agnostic only uh, ontologically in the sense that Huxley meant it, that it's not knowable in some scientific sense. Behaviorally, I'm an atheist. Uh, that is, I act as if there's not a God. Cause but, but not always. Not always. No, I, so I, uh, when I went to Pepperdine University uh, as an undergraduate, I was a, a born-again evangelical. Not the religion you were raised in. Uh, no, I wasn't raised in any religion at all. Uh, no, I, So the number one predictor of anybody's religiosity is their parents. The second one is your peer group. So mine was my peer groups. In high school, this was the early 70s, the evangelical movement was really just taking off. And it was kind of exciting. They sort of rejected mainstream religion. It was the idea that it's just you and God. And you just read the Bible yourself directly, and that's what that's how that sort of took off. It was kind of, and when you're a teenager in early early 20s, that's sort of an anti-authoritarian, yes, we're going to do it ourselves, right? And so when I went to Pepperdine, I took courses in the life of Christ and the Old Testament, New Testament, the writings of C.S. Lewis and all that. I was really into it. Uh, but then I sort of lost my faith in graduate school, mainly um, for a couple of reasons. One, studying that, um, the, the main reason probably was studying social psychology and anthropology. And it became clear that beliefs are socially constructed. It depends where you happen to have been born, mm -hmm. where in the world, uh, what your culture says is true. And it was, that's what psych social psychologists study is, you know, how beliefs are formed based on those kinds of influences. So it got me thinking, well, these other people believe just as much as I believe, and they believe something radically different. So what are the chances I happen to get it right? All these other people got it wrong. Probably none of us are right on that. So I rejected it. So you lost your belief by studying belief. In a way, yes, that's right. It became sort of a self-reflective meta, meta belief. And there were certain behaviors, though, when you were uh, evangelical. Yes, it's only you and God, but you have to spread the word. You were knocking on doors. I was, yes. Yeah. So by, by definition, an evangelical evangelizes. That's what you're supposed to do. And if you think about it, the logic makes sense. If you really know the truth and, 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 it, and the payoff is it's essentially eternal bliss, you are obligated to tell other people about this because if they miss out, then, then they go the other direction. So I went around knocking on people, people's doors. Uh, Amway, for, Amway with Bibles, we called it. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but then I, I sort of saw in myself a certain level of smugness, intolerance, you know, I'm better than you, not in an overt way, just kind of a sense that I later reflected on, like on that bit about, you know, what are the chances I happen to have gotten it right and everybody else is wrong. Uh, that comes a little bit with education and age, I think. And so I later went around all those doors and said, you know what, I, I'm an atheist. No, no I'm kidding. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Guyberson, yeah. you've undergone a journey of belief as well, and I'd like you to tell us your story, too. You were born, though, uh, in very different circumstances. Uh, yes, I was raised in uh, rural New Brunswick, uh, Canada. My father was a uh, fundamentalist Baptist uh, preacher, and I was uh, raised with a belief that one should base all of their life on the Bible, that the Bible was uh, literally true from cover to cover, that it essentially had been dictated by God and should be a guide in all aspects uh, of our lives. Uh, the Canadian fundamentalism is kind of a kinder, gentler version uh, of, of fundamentalism, so it doesn't have the, the hard edge and the angry character of much of American fundamentalism, so I, I wasn't uh, un unhappy uh, in, in any way with it. And I went off to college expecting to become a uh, crusader against the 
uh, theory of evolution and the Big Bang and these various scientific ideas that are threatening uh, uh, belief in the literal truth of the a Bible. A professional. Yes, I wanted to be a uh, professional. I wanted to join the uh, Institute for Creation Research and work with Henry Morris. I, I met him as a uh, freshman in college. And, and idolized him. I did, yes. I, uh, I idolized him. He, I still have a copy of uh, his manifesto, Many Infallible Proofs, that he signed in the front and wrote a Bible verse there. And he encouraged me to, uh, to get my PhD and, uh, and contact him after I finished, uh, finished with that. But uh, it was literally in the middle of my first philosophy course in the spring semester of my sophomore year when I just realized that, that a fundamentalist, biblical, literalist approach to, uh, to Christianity uh, was not sustainable, and it just uh, kind of all came crashing down. It's kind of a brutal uh, way to kind of approach the world. and uh, So that was a, a faith crisis of sorts, but I was at an evangelical college and surrounded by Christians who, uh, who were more liberal than I had been, uh, and so I just kind of migrated in that general direction. And I, and I think, uh, I mean, I didn't study, uh, you know, social uh, psychology, so I wasn't reflecting on the nature of belief. I was studying physics and math and uh, physics in particular has this extraordinary transcendent grandeur mm. to it that kind of makes you always wonder if there isn't kind of something beyond just the flora and fauna of our everyday lives and, uh, and so on. So my belief didn't kind of float away like, uh, like Michael's did. And uh, you've gone to a, uh, I, I guess, a middling uh, position in that, yes, you can be an evolutionist, yes, you can be a physicist, a geologist, you can look at all the sciences and still believe in, well, at least parts of the Bible. Yes, you can be a, uh, a middling position, we can call it. It's sort of like halfway down that slippery slope. I mean, M Michael went kind of over a cliff, I think, <laughs> uh, from the top of the hill to the bottom very quickly. And, uh, you know, I think I slid halfway, uh, halfway there and have kind of found a plateau where, mm -hmm. uh, where things work. And, and I, uh, I mean, there's a lot of effort required to try to figure out how we're going to uh, make meaningful use of the Bible once we've gotten to the point where we can't read it literally anymore. But uh, but I, I still think there's uh, that there's wisdom and value in uh, in the scriptures. Uh, Michael, among the things you continued to study was why we believe what we believe, and indeed there might be a question as to say, having accepted uh, the Bible hook, line, and sinker, uh, then realizing, at least in your belief, that you'd been uh, misled or at least lied to by some people, out, all of it. Right, for the most part for me, yes, all of it. But I had nothing to lose. I wasn't heavily invested in terms of my family. In fact, I, I think my, my siblings were kind of relieved because I finally quit evangelizing to them <laughs> at holidays and family gatherings. Makes Thanksgiving a little tough. Yes, right? yes. I mean, I was always telling them about Jesus. And it's like they, you know, my sister called me a Jesus freak. And it was so when I gave it up, they were like, thank God. <laughs> uh, but Carl mentioned, you know, being surrounded. So Pepperdine, uh, where I went, was a, you know, that was a Church of Christ school, but it was evangelical, whatever. When you're surrounded by that, in, the, in that worldview, it is coherent and consistent and makes all kinds of sense. And then when you leave it and you're surrounded by other people uh, that don't believe that, then that also makes sense. I mean, the worldview makes sense, that, that sort of secular scientific worldview. So that also got me thinking, um, you know, how, how do we know what's actually true, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so science really was the best tool that I could find that at least sets apart the immediate surrounding sphere of influences and says, okay, yeah, we're in this little pocket and we think this is true, but you can actually go do it over there somewhere and you can see if you get the same results we get. And at least it's, it's flaws as it is, it's at least a start at some objectivity. And Carl, it's interesting, you come to some of the same conclusions based on the idea that, well, you know, science isn't exactly what people think it is. It's based on belief systems as well, but to, then you go try to prove it. Yes, it's based on belief systems, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's not based on uh, sort of leaps of faith in the way that uh, religious belief is. I mean, the, 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 the centerpiece of Christian theology is that, that human beings can have a relationship with God who is the creator of the universe, and that's a dynamic... Uh, interaction there and, and you know the physicist doesn't have that interaction with uh, you know the Higgs boson now that we've met it <laughs> in person uh, and so on there so uh, it's, it's, it's a very different type of kind of epistemological claim that you're re you're resting with there I mean I, I think that the great value of science is as Michael says we can get everybody on the same page and, and come to an agreement 
uh, there, although we're actually not doing a very good job in this country on a few issues like evolution and the Big Bang and climate change. Yeah, uh, and throw so in geology and genetics, too, but, yeah. genetics. But, but in, I mean, in principle, you can get scientifically informed people to all converge on the same spot, but you can't get religiously motivated people to all converge on the same theology. Michael, it's also fascinating to me the, the trigger that causes some people to finally ask questions or finally believe that the questions are valid. Questions about evolution and geology date back centuries. You can find people who have just begun to question uh, their literal belief in the Bible on the basis of genetics, which is a rather newer science, but you could have picked any number of sciences in those intervening years as we learn more about it. Why is one trigger persuasive where another isn't? Oh, it probably just depends on the context in which you first encounter it. And, of course, no one's concerned about, say, quantum physics or chemistry or the Well, nobody understands quantum physics. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, uh, well, you do, but... <laughs> I thought it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so it's to what, whatever extent this particular science bumps up against your religious beliefs or your political beliefs or whatever. So uh, that's why, uh, you know, certain fundamentalists are concerned about evolution. They're not concerned about, say, the germ theory of disease or plate tectonics or, or quantum physics or whatever. It's just it's only where it bumps up against that. So then if science has a consensus that this is probably true, you need to actually pick at the ar uh, specific arguments, whether it's ge the genetic arguments for evolution or something like that. Now, um, I, I was reminded when Carl was talking of a, a, a really famous really clever essay by Isaac Asimov, The Relativity of Wrong, I think it was called. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, if you think the Earth is flat, you're wrong. If you think the Earth is round, you're wrong. The Earth is an oblate spheroid. But if you think that thinking the world is flat is just as wrong as thinking the world is round, then you're wronger than both of them. <laughs> <laughs> because there are degrees, right, of yeah. how wrong you can be. And it's the, the virtue of science is that at least it gives us some gradation of climbing toward that upper sort of asymptotic curve toward <laughs> truth, whatever that is. Whatever that may yeah, be, yes. So, I mean, we're never going to get there, but we can approximate it. Uh, and you get a lot of argument as to how close to the uh, X uh, axis we really right. are. So with the God hypothesis, for example, how would you know if you got there? What's the experiment we're going to run? And this is the problem. I think we, this is why Huxley said this, you know, agnostic. We, you just, there's no experiment we're going to run. We go, yep, there it is, significant at the 0.05 level, there is a God. You know, there's just no experiment we can run like that. And Carl Gabrison, there is no answer to those who say, I have a personal relationship with God, therefore I know that there is one. Yes, that's right. I mean, and there's a long tradition within, uh, within Christianity of faith being understood as, as a gift from God. And some people have untroubled faith and go their whole life without uh, doubts. Other Christians spend their lives in a state of partial agnosticism, kind of wishing they had that level uh, of confidence. Uh, and it's not something that just can be turned on when you're uh, a child and kind of it stays on until you're, uh, until you're an adult. I mean, people interact with faith in so many different ways. But I, I think I'd, I'd like to respond to something Michael said, though. It's, it, I mean, it's, it, it's absolutely true that you can't, uh, you can't establish the, the reality of God with the same kind of probability that you can establish other truths. But I think you have to distinguish between kind of easy questions and hard questions. And like, physicists answer easy questions. And so we know a lot about the atom and its internal activities and so on, uh, because that's a very simple problem and we've invested a lot of effort in trying to understand that. Chemists don't know their discipline quite as well as the physicists know theirs. Biologists don't know as well as the chemist. And you get to the economist and they oh. hardly know anything, right? <laughs> I was just uh, going to bring up the economist. There. So, so when, you, when you get to the theologians trying to wrestle with these questions of ultimate reality and so on there, I, I think the, uh, their uncertainty and lack of agreement has more to do with the complexity of the subject matter, assuming there is subject matter, <laughs> uh, uh, there, uh, th than it does uh, anything else. But when you get down to your experience uh, with your faith, the one you were brought up with, and then what you have come to believe as an adult. Uh, that journey is unusual. As Michael points out in his book, one of the more unusual things is to look at a, a, a set of facts and, and change your belief system on the basis of data using, well, reason. Uh, that's unusual. Moving from one peer group to another, that makes sense. But using reason, that's unusual. But, I mean, theology is a very rational 
discipline. And we make fun of the medievals for being so overly rational in their theology. So there's, uh, I mean, it, it would be a mistake, I think, to kind of say that, that the investigation of religious truth is not done in a way that's as rational as it can possibly be, but it's, a, it's just a, a more challenging type of investigation than, uh, than looking at atoms and molecules. But, all right, let me just then go to that question. If you come to the conclusion that the stories of Genesis are wonderful poetry, intriguing, but not the literal truth, not dictated by God, if, how can you unhinge the Old Testament from the New? Well, and that's, that's a big challenge, and you, and you can't, you can't unhinge portions of it uh, entirely and not unhinge kind of all of it partially. And that's one of the challenges that people have. And it's, it's this slippery slope argument that if you can't trust the first page in the Bible, how can you trust the last page and so on? Uh, but biblical scholars provide all kinds of helpful insights. And we've known for a long time, not on the basis of science, but on the basis of biblical studies, that the early chapters in Genesis don't really read like history anyway whereas the accounts of Jesus' life in the New Testament read much more like history, not like we would write history today, but they uh, suggest a different kind of reading there. So, the, I mean, the Bible and the scholars that know the most about it, uh, I think, are, are quite helpful in, in uh, getting us past that kind of literalism from the first page to the end. There's an interesting uh, discussion among some people, uh, conservative evangelicals, who have come to the conclusion that uh, if Adam and Eve didn't exist, then how do you find uh, a, an understanding of Jesus Christ as the Redeemer? Uh, that was the purpose, was it not, that Jesus was brought onto the earth to redeem the original sin, to give us a way out? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a particular theological formulation that's created by St. Paul. Uh, but if you look at the way that the church wrestled with that question prior to Augustine, there were a lot of different ideas about how to uh, how to understand that. And there's no unanimity on, on, on exactly how Christ should be understood uh, theologically. Uh, I mean, I, I would say as, as somebody who kind of uh, doesn't think that Adam and Eve are historical characters, that, uh, that the, the important thing is to understand that human beings are sinful. It's very secondary to kind of come up with some way to account for how they became uh, sinful. And there's certainly no problem with in a, in a standard evolutionary scenario of understanding how we came to be very, very selfish and looking after our own agendas at the expense of others. Uh, and uh, getting back to uh, Michael, that would be evolution. Uh, evolution seems to reward selfishness for the most part. <laughs> well, it can, but it can also reward prosociality and cooperativeness and so on. So I think we have a dual human nature. But, but I do want to uh, respond a little bit here on, on the nature of how religions do change. But in response to what? Is there any new data that, 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 that they've collected to tell us that Jesus was meek and mild and, and a liberal, or all of a sudden now Jesus is a conservative? Uh, I mean, what, you know, these things change with the flow, change of culture. The Mormons uh, you know, conveniently got revelations uh, at, at certain times in history. Just uh, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, they they said uh, blacks are okay now. After the civil, yeah, and before that, uh, you know, just before the United States government was going to send the troops into Utah, they suddenly got a new revelation that polygamy was not such a good idea, which itself was originally a revelation because Joseph Smith wanted to legally date this other woman down the street. Uh, I mean, th there's too much of that that goes on in religion. That's a little bit frivolous, but since we do have a candidate who is Mormon who may be president. Uh, it, sh it should be brought up, uh, but all religions are, are, are like uh, are like this. They have certain dog uh, dogmatic claims that are held to be X, and then all of a sudden X changes to Y for something. There's no new data. Uh, I mean, it, it was it was a new fragment, like the one that was just found, where Jesus says something about my wife, um, and, and there was another one from decades ago where he he's talking about Mary Magdalene, and he says, and, and some and the, one of the disciples says, and he kissed her on her, and then it. It breaks off. It's like, oh, it didn't. It didn't break Where? off. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't break off. It was just the first chapter of the next Dan Brown book. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's so much of that that it, it, it becomes clear that these are obviously socially constructed, totally made up by humans. Uh, the Bible's a wiki. You know, it's just a, <laughs> you know, it's just a compilation over centuries of you know people contributing to it, and and at some point they the church just draws the line and say, there, that's the canon. But, but why should that be? Why not the other Gospels that have been discovered since then? So theologians just keep moving the goalposts. 
I mean, I mean, what Michael is saying is true. No, he he kind of jumped to the conclusion that therefore it's all entirely uh, socially constructed. I mean, I think that the, the church is is very mindful of the tendency to uh, read our own agendas into the scriptures, and there are many people today wailing about the uh, kind of wedding between the conservative Republican agenda and and evangelical Christianity, and so on, saying like that's not what the scriptures are saying at all. Uh, so there are many examples of. Uh, of, of the church internally checking itself on all of these things. But, I mean, Michael's right. I mean, that, that goes on all the time, and, and especially within Protestantism, where you can kind of just go off and start a new religion anytime you want if you think it's going to be better than the old one, and if you can get a, a hearing and a congregation and some money, you can become very successful. Latter-day uh, Saints. Yes. They're you, the Latter-day. Yes. So you, you can <laughs> They're newer very, than yeah. the new. Testament. Well, not lately. Yeah. There's newer yeah. ones than that. Well, Scientology. Uh, but the uh, uh, but then there is also as you as you look back, uh, and, and I'm sure you know this, Michael. There's uh, some evolutionary anthropologists that say belief in faith provides uh, human hunter gatherer groups and small groups of humans with evolutionary advantages. Uh, absolutely. Okay. So that's a separate question. I mean, what's the role of something like religion? Hunter gatherers had religion, but nothing like what religion looks like today. Uh, so if you read the anthropological literature, there's like several roles that something like religion plays. First and foremost is uh, conflict resolution uh, and us getting along as a social primate species where you have the free rider problem and not everybody contributes equally. These are largely egalitarian communities that have to uh, share food and tools and so forth. Uh, but but we, we do have a little bit of a selfish nature. So inevitably somebody tries to get away with just a little bit more meat or put out a little less le effort on the hunt they take few, fewer, lesser risks, but they want the same amount of food. Okay, so, so religion, something like religion evolves as a way of enforcing the rules of cooperativeness. Uh, and so rituals that hunter-gatherers develop then later become codified as religious rituals, but they were there for a very pragmatic reason, for reasons like we, we all have to sit down here in the quad and settle this dispute because you did something bad. Uh, and it, so it comes down to that in, in many respects. It's just a pragmatic way of living together. And those same evidences, uh, uh, as you look at them, Carl, uh, they suggest that religion has evolved along with humanity, that the religions that served the hunter-gatherer organizations did not work so well once humans started to gather into cities. And you got much more hierarchical structures, uh, both in terms of administration and in terms of religion. Well, and, and I think you can see that even if you just read just the Bible from beginning to end. I mean, if you look at the kind of religious behavior and the codes that you encounter uh, in the ancient uh, Israelites, and then you look at the messages of the New Testament, and sometimes they're very much at odds with each other, even to the point where many early Christians wanted to get rid of the Old Testament altogether. So yes, there certainly is uh, uh, evolution uh, within religions, evolution uh, of religion. Uh, the question is whether or not there's any underlying reality to what's going on, whether or not we believe that uh, people that are uh, religious are engaging and wrestling with a reality, God, that is mm -hmm. actually there, or whether it's all just uh, something which has a, a pragmatic value in uh, getting your genes into the next generation, uh, and so on. So we develop these cooperative behaviors. I mean, that, that would be the difference. Uh, but it comes down, does it fundamentally come down to supernatural belief, that leap of faith, that there is something greater than ourselves, uh, some spirit named God who is personally engaged in our activities. Well, I mean, one, one of the things that, that it is, is troubling ab about the, the belief that these uh, altruistic behaviors kind of originate because they kind of are, are helpful in the tribal environment to, to, uh, uh, to survive is, is it kind of suggests that, that the places in the world where we find deep meaning by helping other people and loving our children and so mm -hmm. on, that, that, that there, there really isn't any meaning there. We've just been sort of hoodwinked by our genes. And, and some evolutionary psychologists even use that. I think was it Michael Ruse says it was an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes, something like that. So uh, that, that's why we'd jump on the grenade to save our buddies. Yes, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a little bit troubling to kind of imagine that, like, that we live in a world where things only seem like they're meaningful, but they actually aren't. And I would like to believe, and I think this is a kind of some of the motivation for uh, accepting that God is the fundamental reality and not uh, matter and physical law, 
uh, that when we encounter meaning in the world, that it's, that it's really there, it's intended to be there, that these behaviors where we love other people and so on, uh, that, that that's a part of the way the world is and not just a convenient little delusion that evolution tricked us uh, into accepting. Michael Shermer, as you look at that same body of uh, human behavior, uh, evolution would explain a lot of it, but it, it has a hard time explaining all of it. Right, well, so what happened about five to 7,000 years ago as all these bands and tribes began to coalesce into larger chiefdoms and states, and populations grew from a couple of dozen people that are mostly related to one another and know one another in these hunter-gatherer groups, coalesce to these, these you know, chiefdoms and, and, and so forth of tens of thousands. So you have the free rider problem it multiplied in spades. Um, so it's not enough for us to have an informal set of rules and mores, which we all kind of know, and then when you get out of line, we come down on you pretty hard, pretty quick, and we bring you back into the fold. That's harder to do in, in large state societies. So uh, what happened was is essentially government and religion was invented. Basically, everybody gets a copy of the rules. Here's <laughs> the rules, and these are the punishments if you don't obey the rules. And by the way, that's, so that's government. And by the way, if you think you got away with it anyway, you didn't because there's an eye in the sky keeping track. And in the next life, all justice will be served. Take heed. Right, and this is a way of, in a way of, again, it's just back to behavior control and, and enforcing the rules. And isn't that a little bit conspiratorial? That they, well, how are we going to control those masses? Well, it, it's not, it's not, it's not consciously done. I mean, the people, the tribal leaders, the state, for early state leaders, um, say of Babylonia and Mesopotamia and so on, um, became godhead-like figures as a way of gaining more political power. So. Church and state have always been integrated in this sense because it, it's just a way of not tricking the masses. It's just a way of like continuing your power. And as these societies move from egalitarian to hierarchical, that's what happened. It's just you, you do have to have a more rigid social structure to control a hierarchy of, say, 100,000 people or a million people versus two dozen. And, and so religion is a social tool in that sense. In the intense competition uh, of humans versus humans, the societies that did that more efficiently uh, survived and, and those that didn't were uh, absorbed. Indeed. First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Second commandment, I am a jealous God uh, and, uh, and I will you know, smite those in multiple generations and so forth. Uh, the first several commandments are all about competition amongst different God heads and who is going to rule. So the Old Testament has actually pretty sound evolutionary sense. Love thy neighbor. Who was thy neighbor in these early tribes? It's your immediate kin and kind, the people you really should be good to because you'll need them when times are not so good for you. So it's the tit-for-tat reciprocity, reciprocal altruism. Um, but and, and that's why um, in the next chapter when God instructs the Israelites to destroy you know, the people on the other side of the river because they're not part of our neighbors, uh, that seems so contradictory from a, a, a modern ear, but in fact, it makes perfect sense in a very tribal world in which you should be altruistic, cooperative, nice, and kind and moral to your immediate group. But those other bastards on the other <laughs> side of the river, they're very dangerous. And in fact, they are dangerous, right? So you talk to Jared Diamond, like his new book on hunter gatherers coming out, The World Before Yesterday. Uh, he talks about this because he lives in, amongst the hunter-gatherers in Papua New Guinea. He says, if you walk down a pathway and you encounter some stranger from another tribe, it is suicide to stick your hand out and say, hey, nice to know you. Nobody does that. That's the world we used to live in. So religions, in a way, evolved as a way of, like, is a, is a tribalism that's a good thing, but now we have this tribalism that's not so good. But the process of, of human civilization is a process of redefining the others to say, hey, you know what? They're not so bad. They can... They can, they can live here, too. Uh, they can live amongst us. We can all play by the same governmental rules, but eh, they, they want to worship uh, Gog or Magog. Uh, that might be okay. It's a long, slow pathway, but yes, it's, pro it's progress for sure. And if all believers in the world were like Carl, the new atheists would have nothing to do, <laughs> right? Because this is no problem. It's, there's still, as we know, the elephant in the room, right? There's still Islamic terrorists and other fundamentalists who do not believe that, who, who are not going to be satisfied until every knee bows to the one true faith. We still have this problem. It's better than it used to be, but it's still there. And uh, there are those uh, 
uh, in this country, Carl, who their techniques are not those of Al-Qaeda or, or of the Wahhabis. Nevertheless, uh, they feel very much the same thing. There needs to be a homogeneity. Uh, this all, uh, they have the truth, the light, and the way, and you need to have it too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we saw that with that Congressman Brown and, uh, at Liberty University a week ago talking about uh, evolution and the Big Bang and embryology being lies from the pit of hell that Satan was circulating to keep people from believing in Jesus. I mean, those, those are kind of very dangerous positions for our leaders uh, to hold. But they don't kill anybody, so it's, they, there's progress. They don't kill anybody, but yeah. that's sort of because in our society as a whole, that's not kind of how we deal uh, It's with also them, the big hammer of government, which is right. outside of that context, yeah. at least for now. Secular government. This is the progress of, that's why the secular government is better. Secular just meaning no one's religions get a special privilege. Therefore, we live in a rule of society, a rule of law. And so that's the danger of mixing church and state. It's bad for seculars, but it's bad for religion, too. I, I was just thinking about the, the cover of your most recent issue of your magazine. Tebow. <laughs> George Washington in the Tebow. <laughs> and, and that gets yeah. back to the idea uh, that some hold that, indeed, we are a Christian nation founded by Christians. We need to be uh, true to their understanding of what government was, what religion was, and return to that more homogeneic society. And uh, there's not a lot of evidence that our founding fathers were, in fact, basing government on religious principles. No, I mean, the overwhelming consensus of historians, even conservative evangelical historians, is that the, they were deists and free thinkers, and, and they were, many of them were, were Christians, but they weren't, uh, certainly weren't evangelical fundamentalists, uh, and they weren't trying to make the United States into an evangelical uh, nation. But, uh, but most evangelicals are, have bought into an argument that David Barton and a few others have outlined where he's kind of cherry-picked uh, statements and misrepresented the Founding Fathers in such a way to make them look like they're evangelicals and that this is supposed to be a uh, nation kind of about and for evangelical Christians. Uh, there, but uh, I mean, scholars have rejected his work, but on Main Street, he's very influential. In a few minutes, we're going to take some questions from the audience here at the uh, Patel studio. Uh, and uh, so uh, prepare some zingers, okay? Because <laughs> I need some help here. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Michael, as, as we get back to this, uh, there are entirely enclosed belief systems within this country. There are those who look outside their own group for ideas and, and, and take what's good and, and, and examine it, and take what's bad and throw that away. But there are closed belief systems that reinforce each other, and that is how belief works, correct? It does indeed, yes. So if you're, say, a conservative pro-market and you encounter Al Gore's film, you, you, you're not going to just go analyze the data. Your immediate re knee-jerk response is, this is an attack on business, on, on the free market principles that I stand for, right? So it's the emotional, I guess, implications of how this affects my worldview. Again, the difficulty of uh, taking reasoned argument and changing your belief system as a result. Very hard to do. So, uh, you know, the, the older you are, the more committed you are behaviorally to a belief system. That is, like if you're religious and everybody you know goes to church, the people you work with go to church, same church and so on, it's all reinforced. If you're young and you're not, you're not married and so on, there's no commitment to it, it's easy to give it up. So uh, the more your, say, conservative worldview is wrapped up in, say, free market economics and you believe that climate change is just a liberal conspiracy to attack business, well, there's no way you're going to look at a data set and analyze, you know, the ice core data and go, oh, you know what, I was wrong. You know, you just you just listen to Rush Limbaugh. Well, Rush said, you know, that ice core data is a bunch of, not, you know, like Rush Limbaugh is a scientist, right? So, but of course, people, they they watch, they filter the news, they just tune in the channels that reinforce what they already believe. Everybody does this. Liberals do it, conservatives do it, libertarians do it. Sure, and and there are uh, liberal ideologies that uh, we were talking earlier about the uh, the the belief among some that autism is the result of vaccinations. And uh, we're already seeing uh, the results of this in society and unprecedented rates of things like whooping cough that uh, you would think would have been virtually eliminated. Yet there is this belief amongst some, uh, and it, it is so reinforced. Of course, they're trying to protect their children. Uh, that's the belief system. 
and Carl, as, as, you, as you look at these phenomena in society, and I wanted to connect it with the, uh, the big sort, uh, the understanding uh, in the book by the same name, that we choose as we become a more mobile society, a society with more choices, that people choose to live amongst others of their own kind, that their own kind being their political beliefs, and that you're getting, therefore, solidly red districts and solidly blue districts, and people can pick up the signs uh, by the kinds of stores and the kinds of churches in the neighborhoods that they scout out to, to, to think about moving into. Well, I mean, and that's very clear within the, what Randall Stevens and I call the parallel culture of evangelicalism in our, in our book, The Anointed, where we, we examine the way that if, if you take the uh, conservative evangelical community, particularly in the South, uh, with, the, with the network of churches and Christian schools and parachurch organizations and summer camps and vacation Bible schools and weekend seminars. I mean, all these things kind of work together. Theme to, parks. Yeah, theme <laughs> parks. I mean, it's, it's, it's all there. I mean, you can listen to Christian radio. You can listen to Christian music. You can read Christian magazines. You can read Christian novels. Uh, so, I mean, Tim LaHaye has sold 100 million of those Left Behind novels mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, there, there's the whole world there so that you can kind of live insulated in, within that world. And within that world, if you take just... Uh, evolution, the, the uh, example that I've studied the most, but you, you find that, that people that live entirely within that world just have absolutely no idea that there's any evidence for evolution. I mean, I uh, had someone challenge me uh, last night as I was speaking at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and, and he puts up his hand and just says, like, there's no transitional fossils, so how can you believe in evolution? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's heard that somewhere, that there aren't any transitional fossils. Uh, there are authorities that these people follow. There are uh, explanations they have for the, the data that they don't like. There's a Sunday school curriculum that starts them out thinking about the world in a certain way, and then by the time they become an adult, uh, they've got these PhDs over here who think the Earth is 10,000 years old, and they've got this explanation that the scientific community is largely uh, anti-religious, and they promote ideas that intentionally undermine belief in God. Uh, that Satan is real and this is very much a, a, a warfare that's, that's spiritual in nature and that Satan is kind of working to destroy belief uh, in the Bible and in creation and so on. And, and all of this kind of just makes a really tight package like, like Michael was talking about. And, I mean, and, and that's what we're up against. I mean, it, it, there's no value whatsoever in, in showing transitional fossils to uh, somebody who's a young earth creationist. I mean, they've got all kinds of other reasons why they... Uh, We'll, we'll reject what you're saying. And, and Michael, ideas have consequences too. Uh, this plays into the current situation in the Middle East in this belief that uh, these are the last days. The end times. Well, that part is true. December, well, <laughs> December 21st, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, that's another. That, <laughs> that's, that's the Mayan belief calendar. But. I do worry about that. Uh, you mentioned the, the vaccines and autism. Uh, you know, to be fair, and critiquing the other side, there are what I call amongst many liberals, cognitive creationists. They fully accept evolution all the way up to the neck. And then, the, you know, the brain is not an evolved organ. Essentially, it's a blank blob ready for culture to shape. And, um, or if, if there's a profit motive to be made. So the vaccinations are made by big profit motive pharmaceutical companies. Or if you can ever t have a conversation with a liberal on genetically modified organisms where the word Monsanto doesn't come up. It's like Monsanto's making these, yeah. that's why they're making money. So we all have our biases, the left, the right, the religious, the non-religious. And so always it comes down to what's the quality of the evidence. Is there somebody else that's not in my political camp that can check these facts? And in the case of, for example, genetically modified organisms, uh, as far as I can tell, there is no scientific evidence to distinguish uh, corn that's uh, been altered to, uh, uh, for Roundup, uh, the, the, the insecticide, uh, there's, no distinct, there's nothing to distinguish it chemically, biologically, right. or any other way from other corn. Right. Yep. It's, I think it's just purely political. It's just, uh, well, so although Christians say have uh, a moral value they place high on the sanctity of the human body, the purity and sanctity of the human body. That's why premarital sex is a sin, adultery is a sin, and so on. Well, the left has something, a, a version of that, where the environment, the air, the water, the purity of nature, you know, we shouldn't genetically modified foods. We've been genetically modifying foods for 10,000 years. You know, the original ears of corn are like that big, right? So, uh, And delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pop them in. Yeah. 
right? So um, we all have moral values we you know cherish in a very emotional way, both the left and the right. And science just gets modified or chucked out the window when it when it bumps up against that. Carl, though, I wanted to ask you, getting back to evolution, there were all these other sciences. We tend to think of Darwin as the first. No. Uh, geologists were the first. Darwin also studied geology. That's not where he got into trouble uh, with, the, with his family, among others. But the, uh, why is it evolution? Is it the rejection of the belief that we are related to apes? Well, I, I, it's, it's really more political than that. If, if you look at the, at the history of how these ideas em emerged and what the immediate response to them was, uh, when the geologists in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th century are finding out that the Earth is very old, most of those geologists are Christians and they're all fine with it and nobody's having a theological trauma uh, over this. And then uh, evolution comes along and uh, 30 or so years after uh, evolution, the, the anti-modernist movement kind of begins within American Christianity and, and fundamentalism emerges in, uh, in the uh, years leading up to the Scopes trial, there's a whole set of books produced called The Fundamentals, and out of those books we get this movement now we call fundamentalism. And if you read through The Fundamentals, you do not find consistent anti-evolutionism uh, in them. Uh, in fact, you find several of those leading uh, and mo sort of most authentic fundamentalists saying there's no problem with evolution. We can find ways to read Genesis that are compatible. Uh, with this, and it was it was frustrating to the anti-evolutionists at the time of William Jennings Bryan that they couldn't get their viewpoint into the fundamentals as something central to the faith. And so it really wasn't until the 1960s, with the publication of Henry Morris's uh, book, The Genesis Flood, that uh, Christians began to kind of coalesce around this young Earth creationist movement, and Christianity became uh, uh, evangelical Christianity became very anti-evolutionary at that point. And this includes the theory that, for example, all of those structures like the Grand Canyon can be explained as a product of the Great Flood. It was uh, all carved when all of this uh, water washed into the sea. Right. All the surface features of the earth, uh, all the fossils laid down in the strata, uh, all the layers in the geological column, all of these things are the artifacts of, of Noah's, uh, Noah's flood. I mean, it, it, it's a it's an idea that's almost unbelievable, except for the fact that 100 million Americans believe it. <laughs> and, and <laughs> other than that. Yes. <laughs> and, and a lot of other things, too, Michael. Uh, Americans believe in angels. Americans believe in the devil. Americans believe in hell. Yep. It's usually, it, it depends on which, which one of those you want to pick, but it's anywhere from one-third to two-thirds of Americans believe any of those. So it's prominent, for sure. You'd think in an age of science, we'd be doing better than that. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, 99% believed in the Middle Ages and in, in those sorts of things. So we are we are making we are making progress. 99% <laughs> of those in Europe believed yes, in those things. That's right. Yeah, there yeah. were a whole bunch of other people elsewhere right. who uh, believed in other nonsense, perhaps, but but so not that. Our our point at, at Skeptic, uh, the mission here is that there is no paranormal or supernatural. There's just the normal, the natural, and all the things we can't explain yet. The brain is wired up to just find hidden agents and invisible beings and powerful forces at work behind the scenes. That's just what our brains do. We impugn essence into things, uh, invisible essences, like um, uh, Bruce Hood's famous study where he put uh, Brad Pitt's sweater up for sale on eBay, a shirt, washed and unwashed. And guess which one got the higher price? It's, you know, the mm -hmm. unwashed one. Ooh, the essence of Brad Pittness is in the shirt, right? So we impose, you know, or would you wear? He did. He, he's yeah. the guy who did. Uh, you know, would you wear Hitler's jacket or or Jeffrey Dahmer's, you know, sweater? You know, ooh, no. But Mr. Rogers' cardigan sweater. Oh yes, that would feel so good, right? So this essence that we put into things, it's only a small step yeah. for the essence of ghosts or the essence of aliens or conspiracies or gods or angels and demons and that's just what our brains do. I, there may be good evolutionary reasons for this but nevertheless it's there and so it's rampant and uh, we, we just always have to be careful with the language we use, paranormal, supernatural. It's like when astronomers talk about dark energy. They don't, need, they don't mean that as that's the answer. It's just a linguistic placeholder until we figure out what it is. The problem with paranormalists and supernaturalists, they, they use those words like that is the answer. And it's like, no, that is not the answer. All that is is just a word, paranormal or this force or, you know, Deepak's this, you know, the 
powerful spirit or you know, mm. consciousness or whatever. It's Broadcasters still like to talk about the ether. It's been some time since that was debunked. The ether, yes, yeah. right. <laughs> yes, the ether is floating out there. So, yeah. uh, but yeah. then there's the, yeah. the chicken and the egg, uh, Carl Guyberson. Are our brains wired to see these patterns uh, by evolution or uh, what guides that? I think you would argue that there's a, uh, there's a plan here. Well, if, I mean, if, if it is the case, as, as I think it is, that, that evolution kind of occurred kind of in the presence of God and that God was somehow involved in that process from beginning to end, not in, in some uh, steady, tinkering, deterministic way, but in, in some way, uh, then we would expect that what we get at the end of that uh, long process is something that's kind of congenial to the plan that God had, which... Uh, as a Christian, we believe included the possibility that we could be in relationship with our uh, with our Creator, uh, but uh, I mean, I, and, I mean, unfortunately, Michael's right about the sort of the panoply of, of supernatural beings that, that people believe in. But a lot of uh, I mean, a lot of very thoughtful Christians are uh, are exploring sort of a Christianity free of angels and demons, and there's a lot of discussion now about whether. Uh, whether it's time to move past belief in hell and, and, and mm. so on like that. A very controversial book by Rob Bell now called Love Wins, suggesting that kind of ultimately uh, the, the, the true Christian belief is that everybody would need to uh, spend eternity with God, that nobody would... Uh, it's going to cost us a lot hell. of jokes. Uh, it will. <laughs> yes, right. There's a, <laughs> a lot of Halloween costumes will uh, go out the window then. Oh, they, they, never, yeah. they never go out of fashion. Uh, I'm of the belief that uh, if you turn a switch on a box, you can hear voices from Washington, D.C. Oh, but you can't hear intelligent voices. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> We'd like to hear some intelligent voices uh, from the audience. If you'd like to ask our, our panelists a question, please come up to the microphone. And uh, who'd like to be first? Please go ahead. I'm right next to you, so I get to go first. So this is for Mr. Shermer. Um, so earlier you were asking questions about about how you might make some kind of theological progress, and you were complaining that that there's not any new data uh, that's being dealt with, and maybe that's some kind of a problem. Um, so so I was just pretty enamored of the idea that that physics is actually a relatively easy um, uh, field because all you got to do is go and measure things about the world, and then you get your answers, right? But but there are a number of other interesting questions that that you can't really answer just by going and and measuring the world. Questions about I mean, like the deepest philosophical questions. What's the nature of existence? What's the nature of knowledge? What's the nature of goodness? Right? Things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it does seem like we can make at least some kind of progress in those fields, much slower progress. And the way we do that is not by obtaining new data, but just by trying to think really clearly about, about what the core concepts are and how they relate to each other and what the imp different implications of different views are and why we might accept those and not accept those. And I just wanted to hear what you had to say about that kind of rational progress that isn't data-driven, but it's some other type of progress. Right. Well, it could be data-driven. Let's just take some, like, a moral question. Are things getting better or not? So, say Steve Pinker's new book, The Better Angels of Our Net Nature, 800 pages of documented data sets showing that things are getting better, violence is declining, or so on. Or Matt Ridley's book, The Rational Optimist, you know, 400 pages of documented uh, data sets of how much better life is for more people in more places more of the time. All of us are far richer than the richest person two centuries ago. The average Joe today uh, is, has more servants than uh, Louis XIV had. Uh, you go down to Starbucks, there's a barista waiting for you right now to make your latte just the way you like it, right? And so, um, so those are measurable, quanti you know, qu quantifiable, measurable things. Even a moral thing, like uh, Sam Harris's argument in the moral landscape that that the um, well-being of conscious creatures is a way of defining morality. What does that mean to be moral? Well, you care about the well-being of conscious creatures. And we can quantify that. You know, democracy is really better than a theocracy or a dictatorship. Uh, a liberal democracy is better than a non-liberal democracy. And just go around the world and see where it's better for people to live. And, 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 and I think we can make moral judgments and go, that is really a better worldview. It's a superior lifestyle. It's a better political system than that one in a quantifiable, measurable way. Now, not everybody thinks that. Most people don't think that in the social sciences, but I, I do. Next. Um, so if we're, if we're thinking that uh, a lot of religious experience and religious ecstasy occurs in the brain, um, how, what is the role of those experiences in the modern world or, or in the secular world? 
Well, it, it, okay, so where did it come from in the first place? Uh, obviously, there's, there's a neural, neural pathways with neural chemistry that does this, so why would it be there? And it may be an artifact, just a byproduct of the brain evolved for some other reason, and it's hijacked by these hallucinogenic drugs or something like that. Of course, then it gets co-opted by either hunter-gatherers who use it as kind of a spirit trip that you take or modern drug druggies just for fun. Um, so it, it, it's very much cultural dependent on how it's interpreted. So for example, if you stimulate the temporal lobes, just a, a little tiny part of the temporal lobes just above your ears, you can get people to have an out-of-body experience. Um, there's really good studies on this with epileptic patients where they do open brain surgery and while they're in there, they poke around with an electrode. They wake the patient up after, after they've gone through the surgery and, <laughs> uh, and then poke around and say, what are you experiencing now? This is one way that neuroscientists map the brain. And uh, so you, you can, in this one spot, you can get the right leg to float up or the left leg or the whole body to float up by the ceiling. If you crank it up, whoa, I'm way up by the ceiling now. Okay. Oh, I'm way just three feet above the bed now. And uh, so that, that, why that's there, who knows? But it, it's definitely there. And then so let's say you have an out-of-body experience or an alien abduction experience or whatever. Your culture tells you what to call it and how to talk about it. But it's there because it's, a, it's there in the brain. It's a neuroscience activity. Another question? Yeah, I was wondering, in, uh, relating to the new Pew Research poll, it says one in five Americans is probably now in the non-believer category. Uh, they're called nuns, but they don't wear habits. But I'm <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Do either of you see um, any easing of the negative associations with that from the four out of five people? Carl? Uh, well, the, the first thing, uh, you need to qualify a little bit what nun means. I mean, those are people who will sort of look at a list of affiliations, you know, Baptist, Mormon, Catholic, and say, I'm not any of those. Uh, they're not atheists. So it would be a mistake to kind of say that the ranks of the atheists have grown to 20% now based on this uh, new poll, although evidence is showing that the atheists you know, are growing <laughs> incrementally uh, there. So I mean, I, I think what we're seeing is, is a great frustration with institutionalized religion. And there's a lot of discussion of that in the conservative uh, churches today, uh, where the data is showing that uh, huge numbers of kind of 20-somethings are, are leaving their churches uh, and just becoming a nun of some, of some sort. Uh, but, but many of these are young people who are still very passionate about social justice and they give to causes and they're, and, and they're still religious believers and would call themselves a Christian, but they just can't find any institutional home. I should point out Northern European countries are very, not nearly as religious as we are, less than half. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, for example, and they have high levels of charity. They, they have, you know, their the scores of happiness are off the charts. Um, they're health, they're socially healthy. They have very low rates of homicide and suicide and STDs and teen uh, suicides and that sort of thing. Uh, high tax rates too. Well, yes. <laughs> but they're socialists. <laughs> they're that a makes, bunch of. That, that, a, make, that makes them bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Can't have everything. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, as the three of you spoke, you said that no one religion, the ideal of no one religion getting special privilege. And I'm wondering if there is an underlying religious belief that, that, that seems to be held here as we're talking. And I'm thinking in terms of scientism and the idea that all knowledge can and should be gained through science. Now, I'm not arguing with science as a way of knowing, but that it being the way. And I think that when we move towards that or when we're when we live with that supposition, then things like the literature, arts, humanities are seen in a lesser light, as they tend to be now, um, that anyone having any kind of mystical, magical view, I mean, we, you know, th there was kind of the joking about those who you know, believe in angels. Well, most of us, uh, certainly 200 years ago, all of our relatives did believe in you know, all these magical, mystical things. And, who are we to say science has not proven that these things don't exist? And so we hold this scientism that this is really the valid way. You, you know, if I may quote, you'd think that in an age of science we'd be, we'd be doing better than that. And, and even I think this affects the way we deal with problems like global climate change. So we come at it with purely technological solutions, applied science, rather than looking at quality of life and what changes we may want to make in our lifestyles. And are we truly happy? in terms of the way we're living with our relationship with technology and that as it is, and can we, you know, can we live greener lifestyles? And, and does all that 
that scientism that I think that we tend to lean into, does that actually lead to the fundamentalism? I mean, because, because really, if we hold that all belief, all knowledge can and should be gained through science, then we're saying, you know, you guys are full of it. Uh, you, you know, any, any sort of religious belief, any, any sort of mystical belief, and so, it, in some ways, I mean, I certainly don't hold that belief that they hold, but it would make sense in a way to, to turn away from science, to deny evolution, to deny these things, and to create our own insular world. And so I think that there is a true danger of scientism. Yes. And I just would love so, to hear comments from right. any or all three of you. All right. Yeah. Well, the, so I, I'm often accused of, this, of, of practicing scientism, and I usually say something like guilty, discharged. <laughs> uh, I, but, but I mean that only as a tool to understand the world. Um, so we have to distinguish that from, say, the internal subjective experience of, say, aesthetic appreciation of art and music and love and all the emotions that uh, we can we can apply science to understand why we feel that way why oxytocin makes me want to cuddle more <laughs> whatever and uh, or you know testosterone makes me more competitive whatever it is but that's different from the actual feeling of like love and emotions and enjoying a sunset or something like that so I, I think we just need to distinguish those and it's not like you have to have science to appreciate a sunset you don't but 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 it, it's fun to know a little bit more about why it looks the way it does and why we feel about it neurochemically, but that doesn't take away from it. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this year's Controversies in Science discussion. I'd like to thank our guests, Carl Giverson and Michael Shermer. I'd like to thank our audience here at WOSU at COSI and all of our viewers. I'm Neil Conan from NPR's Talk of the Nation, and good night. This program is made possible by the John Templeton Foundation and is a co-production of COSI, the Ohio State University, and WOSU Public Media.